Welcome everyone to the Made You a Mixtape podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Hope you're doing well. Look, I'm really excited about this one because I have been reading a ton of books uh, during the whole quarantine process. And one of the authors that I discovered as I was, you know, reading my way through the pandemic is the X Hero series from Peter Klein's, his latest uh work that you can get terminus is available on audible and we have peter Kleins here on the show peter welcome to the show how are you hi i'm great thanks for having me one of the things i i have to say uh because i'm a huge sci-fi fan huge sci-fi fan and one of the things i really found about reading the x hero series is that it feels like you yourself have a massive love of science fiction considering the number of references that you put in there. So let's, let's talk about your love of science fiction. What, what, what was it that drew you into the genre? I mean, everything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I, I just happened to by sheer luck to grow up at like a, I think a, a beautiful little nexus point for aspiring nerds where, Within a couple years in my childhood, we had Star Wars. Um, there was a ton of hard sci-fi stuff coming out of like Marvel Comics was doing their toy adaptations of like Micronauts, ROM, also more Star Wars. Um, I had an uncle who's only a couple of years older than me, and he sort of dumped a bunch of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs books on me. So I had all these John Carter of Mars books. Um and then, you know, like a lot of the stuff you'd find at the school library, um, Lloyd Alexander books, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, Madeline Lengel, all those sort of things. It just, I don't know, it, I don't want to say it was inevitable, but it kind of looks Looking back, I don't see how I couldn't have been a sci-fi fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. It's, as we were talking before uh, before actually getting this interview, I mentioned that the, the fact that you name-dropped Harry Harrison uh, <laughs> in one of the books, because Harry Harrison, for me, was maybe the first science fiction author I got to read, so I, I, I felt kind of right at home. But one of the things that was also uh, really stuck out was the um, – in the acknowledge, sorry, in the acknowledgement section of Excommunication, which is the third book in the X Hero series, you mentioned that the main characters of the series, which for the listeners who are interested, it's basically as as you know, kind of the tagline goes, Avengers meets uh, Walking Dead. Phenomenal series. I highly recommend going to pick up the books. But you mentioned that these characters had been with you since you were five years old. So clearly, you had a love of writing like at, at a young age. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, you kind of developed that to the, get to this point? I mean, <clears throat> pardon me. I think the weird thing is I didn't think about it as writing for a long time. I just thought of it about telling stories because I was very much one of those kids who had, uh, like I would set up all my action figures and stuff to do little stories. Like I had, I had the day by day diorama. So I'd have like, you know, 40 different guys in this set. And then, okay, so today this guy moves here. That guy's doing that. This person's doing this. And this guy's going to do that. He's just scared. He's doing <laughs> Um, So I'd be doing all that. Um, I cannot remember. I mean, I loved comic books. And I know it was sometime around the age of 10. And this sounds really goofy in retrospect. But again, little kid, it suddenly struck me that comic books weren't this like single person endeavor. Like I'd seen there's, there's all these names that mean something that I, all those extra words at the bottom of the first page that I never pay attention to. And suddenly I realized like, wait, there are people who write these and people who draw these and people who color them and all this stuff. So um, I got sort of doubly fascinated one with writing stories about my favorite comic book characters, but then also just making up my own. And so I, I, over the course of, you know, my prepubescence, made up all these characters like the Mighty Dragon and Zap and Cerberus and Banzai and the Driver and Gorgon. And uh, as you might, might already know, it, that's kind of what sparked the whole X-Heroes thing was years later, I stumbled across uh, one of the old notebooks I had that had all these very awful drawings of these characters and realized, hey, these are like still, I mean, they're kind of garbage. They they feel like something a 10 year old made up, but 
they're also very classic hero archetypes. And it wouldn't take much to make a lot of them, you know, into this cool character, that cool character. So, and the the series has been, you know, from what I can tell, pretty embraced. I mean, I, I think if I remember correctly, you tweeted a picture of someone who was cosplaying as stealth. So, how refreshing is it to see, um, you know, that those creations, you know, that, that from a young age, you know, take on this life and be accepted by everybody else. It's weird. It's, it, I mean, I'm, I'm sure every, well, I know most creative people have this bizarre sense of when you start realizing how embraced, how loved something you did it feels or not feel like just that like it gets out there into the world and people fall in love with this stuff so much. And as someone who fell in love with other people's stuff, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it's still just amazing to me. I mean, I, I, one of the bizarre things was, I think we talked about this a little bit. I used to work in the film industry too. And I have a lot of friends who still do. And a friend of mine, uh, one of my old uh, partners was working on Castle. Uh, and I get this text and he's like, hey, you're not going to believe this, but Nathan Fillion's reading one of your books right now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's a huge zombie fan. He's reading it too. <laughs> Now, one so, one of the coolest things, uh, because you have your your uh, your writer on writing blog, and one of the uh, the cool things I was reading in there was that at a very young age, you submitted to Marvel Comics. So, can you kind of tell us about you know working up the courage to do that, and of course, like the 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 letter that kind of came back and the, and that impact on you? It it wasn't so much a courage thing; it was I didn't know any better thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's like. Telling a little kid, you were so brave touching that hot stove. <laughs> ow, ow. Yeah, exactly. That's it. I, I had no idea what it was doing. I I cannot remember why or how I got into my, like the exact chain, but I do know for some reason I assumed, I think I had figured out that the person you need to submit to is the editor. And I'm not sure how I even learned that much. But then I wasn't sure like, well, what editor did you send it to? All the books have different editors. So I figured, well, obviously you just send it to the editor in chief. So, <laughs> so I did. And I was just sending these horrible, horrible submissions, finger quotes, um, out to, at the time it was Jim Shooter and then Tom DeFalco. Um, Cause I didn't know any better, like who this stuff should go to, how it should be formatted. And they, they were awful. Um, but what happened that was really big for me was so I sent off the first one to Jim Shooter and I know he gets a lot of crap but what happened was I got back this very polite very professional rejection letter from him that was to me it was like an actual letter from Jim Shooter to me just very much treating it as if I was a seasoned pro who'd sent him something he wasn't that interested in and getting that that sort of immediate level of respect, even though like, in re- especially in retrospect, realizing what a piece of garbage I had sent him. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean I'm mean, i pretty sure I had also included like, here's cover art that I did with colored pencils. And, you know, just, just imagine every bad little kid thing. Um, so that got super encouraging. And then I sent a couple others. I would get back other letters from him just very, but no, sorry, no. No, at no point realizing or even commenting from him that I should not be sending these to him. And when he left, I sent one to Tom DeFalco, not knowing any better. And Tom DeFalco wrote back and he was even more amazing because he was like, okay, look, you're, you're obviously very enthusiastic. You care about this stuff. Here's what you need to know. So I had actually gotten back from Tom DeFalco this, I still have it, this big envelope with like a Marvel Spider-Man mailing label on it. And he sent me, here's like our Marvel style guide. Here's our current Bible writer requirements. And just to help you out, here's the script to a Thor issue I just wrote. Um, and it was actually, if you're a Marvel fan, it was the, he sent me the script to uh, the once in future Thor. Oh, wow. The, the story that introduced Dargo, the future Thor who finds the hammer. So, yeah, and that was very encouraging. But then, oddly enough, what happened was right around that time was also when comics suddenly started becoming cool. 
And I think they started getting flooded with more and more and more submissions. And so honestly, from that point on, every submission, every response I got became more and more and more impersonal <laughs> after that, to the point that at one point it hit that you weren't even getting rejection letters anymore from Marvel. You were actually getting photocopies of rejection letters. Oh, geez. Because they didn't want to like print their, their letterhead, their everything. So you were literally just getting a photocopy of a rejection letter that somebody would sign to let you know that you'd actually been seen. And then I think my last two, even the signature was photocopied. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that basically boils down to that we wish you well in your future endeavors. If, if even that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for any kind of creator, whether it be a writer or for a musician or for a video creator, one of those hard to get early things is, is proper critical criticism that's designed to help you know so often you know you you have people read or listen to or watch and they go oh that's 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 nice you must have worked really so, hard on that that's so good yeah mm-hmm. you should be proud yeah it, it, it's so you you know but to, to actually get like like you mentioned you know real critiques real helpful hints from someone of that stature from marvel how 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 formative do you think that that w- became upon you? Um, I think it was good just in a sense. I mean, these obviously weren't, I was not getting back in-depth critiques of anything, but even just having someone flat out tell me, you know, politely and all, but this isn't good enough yet. You know, that you, that you have to try harder than this. And Honestly, I think that is a, a great first encouragement for someone. Like, you don't need to tell them, my God, this is the lamest idea ever. You Just the simple encouragement that you can do better than this. So. Now, on your writer on writing blog, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're, you're, you're very, very, like, you know, you know, eloquent and elaborate about, you know, you know, life as a writer and all the, 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 the highs and lows that kind of come with the process. So how much of that blog is catharsis for you and how much of it is putting that stuff out there as a published author for people who wish to be published authors you know you're you're basically your way of kind of giving that helpful advice to those who were in your seat that long ago it's it's both definitely it actually it's funny you mentioned catharsis because that's exactly what it started as um the first like four or five if you go all the way back to i think it was 2007 when i started it um at the time I was writing for a screenwriting magazine called Creative Screenwriting. And I was also reading screenplays for a ton of different contests as like a side gig, you know, where you'd get like 10, $20 to read a screenplay and just say, this should not be in the contest, whatever. And it started driving me nuts how often I would see the same basic mistakes again and again and again and again. And I mean like basic mistakes, things like, okay, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of spell checkers as the end all be all, but you clearly didn't even run this through a spell checker. Um, you know, there's that you didn't even bother to learn how to format a script. You, every character in this has the same letter for their first name. I got like one script and every character was like, John, Jessica, Jason, Jacob. <laughs> J-. And it's like, how was anyone supposed to keep track of this? Um, So I wrote a couple of things for the magazine of, okay, look, here's what you need to do. If you're going to do this, you need to understand this. You need to understand this. And I actually pitched it to the magazine as a telling them, you know, it's weird that we don't actually have a writing column for the magazine. Like we, we talk to writers, we talk about this, we talk about that, but we don't actually have any sort of column, any pieces on just writing. And they were like, no, you're right. We don't. Um, so that became a thing to me because I also, the more I would look around online, it seemed to me that so many people were offering advice for what to do with your finished manuscript. You know, here's how to get an agent. Here's how to foot it, the foot in the door with an editor. Here's how to succeed at self-publishing. Here's how to do this. But nobody was actually 
offering any hints that I could find of, look, here's how to make better characters. Here's how to do better dialogue. Here's how to structure a story so it makes sense, you know? Um, so it just sort of grew into that and slowly became less cathartic over time that, I mean, honestly, the first year of it is me pulling my hair out of, no, don't do this. I'm sick of seeing people do this. <laughs> um, but it has grown to be a little more encouraging and friendly of like, okay, look, you know, this is real easy to do. Just think about how you would do this in your normal life. Think about that. Because the truth is any decent writer or decent musician, any, you know, any sort of artist, you know, has gotten some degree of help in some level or another from somebody else along the way. And I'm also a big believer that one of the other things is we, if you are any sort of artistic creative person, you have to find your way of doing things. That yes, there is sort of this textbook, here's how you construct a sentence, but that's why fiction writers all have their own voice because they all figure out, but this is how I like to do sentences. This is how I like to tell a story. This is how I like to do dialogue. Um, these are the kind of stories I wanna tell. I mean, you, if, you know, you can't just sort of tell every musician you have to start off with classical music and compose two operas before you can go on to do the punk rock album you want to do or whatever. Um, Cause it just doesn't work that way. People aren't wired that way. So I'm babbling. This is a topic I can babble. About. <laughs> oh, bab babble on by all means babble on. <laughs> but, but in, in the babbling, you know, and in the blogging, you actually said something that, 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 caught me off guard it's it was something you said about you know in your opinion most of your audience are audiobook fans and i mean that just seems odd to me because you know i i love to sit down with a book i love to actually turn the pages i love the smell of a bookstore I, you know that's just me but you do see a lot more work going into audiobooks and a lot more of that audience so do you think that's almost kind of the way the industry is heading where it's you know, the actual physical media is gone i don't think it's it's necessarily the way the industry is heading i know people will argue many things back and forth on this i think paper books are going to be around for a long time still i think ebooks are going to be around for a long time still i think the the big reason we're seeing such or we've seen such huge growth in audiobooks over the past 10 years especially, is that for the longest time, audiobooks meant you have that big vinyl briefcase thing from the library loaded with like cassettes or CDs or something. And that was an audiobook. Um, and it was just extremely inconvenient. This wasn't something you could like, you know, use on your commute to work. This isn't something you could exercise to listen to going around the, you know the house it's just it's a big clumsy thing and when you have to stop every 30 minutes to flip the cassette over or something it's annoying um and it's very hard i think to get into stories that way um i don't know that they were the pioneer in this but when audible started doing things as digital downloads as you know basically large mp3 files and suddenly we could take audiobooks anywhere and audiobooks became just as easy, just, if anything, more convenient than paper books, ebooks. That audiobooks could be the thing you could listen to in your car on the way to work with no issues whatsoever. You know, um, you didn't have to worry about the tape running out while you were in heavy traffic and you couldn't flip it over, or that you got the wrong cassette with you for the next one, or that you left the big final briefcase in the car and it melted all the cds or something <laughs> you know um so i think that is why uh audiobooks are searching or have surged as a general medium i know i i again none of this is like gospel by the numbers of fact i think sales overall in audiobooks have sort of like not plateaued, but I think we're starting to get a better sense of, okay, where are they really now as time goes by? Um, and there's always going to be specialty auto things, just like there are specialty exclusive ebook things, exclusive paper things, whatever. Um, as for me personally, I mean, I can say I, most of my fans are audio because I see the numbers. So I know that. Um, I think I just kind of lucked out that 
Um, one of the first publishers I was with, Commuted, struck a deal with Audible, and I just happened to have audiobooks out at a time when zombies were a big thing, superheroes were becoming a big thing. So it struck a chord with a lot of people, and I got known that way. Um, I also got very lucky that, again, years ago, um, Audible on a whim matched me up with uh, an up-and-coming narrator named Ray Porter, who had done a couple books for a friend of mine, Jonathan Mabry, um, and Ray and I just hit it off immediately that his, his voice and style of narration work very well with my voice and style of writing, and we kind of became a hit team together so and so that helped and then ray went off and became you know a dark god of the universe (laughs) in justice league and we don't talk anymore (laughs) now now that's not true actually i talked to her i i should hope so always be on the god side it's always good Ray, ray is seriously such a wonderful person for i like like we're saying i worked in hollywood for a long time there's a lot of awful people in hollywood and there's people you just you're so glad when a project's over you don't have to see them again and ray is just so wonderful all the time anyway sorry (laughs) now when you listen to an audiobook you know you you've got the ones where it's pretty much just one person sitting in a booth you know calmly reading through the entire book and then you have like the full on audio productions with music and sound effects and a, you know, cast longer than some Hollywood films. You know, if you're listening to one of these, which do you prefer? Do you prefer like the solo reader or do you prefer the, you know, the full on production? I've enjoyed both. Um, like I just went through most of uh, the big Sandman audiobook that Audible put out a while back. Um, or audio series, I guess, which is like you said, a full production thing with numerous actors, um, you know, readers, sound effects, music, all of it, Ray's in that too. <laughs> um, but uh, and I really enjoyed that. I really enjoy listening to solo things. I think a lot of it depends on the particular project that you're, or not project, but the, you know, what you pick up. There are times you want to listen to this. There are times you want that, you know, just like, just like anything. There are times, you know, if you're skimming through Netflix, you don't want to watch a comedy. You don't want to watch whatever. So I I don't really have a preference. Um, I mean, on one level, I would love to see somebody do a a huge, big production of one of my books. Um, I know the X heroes books have multiple cast members, but I think the decision for that was just because, pardon me, excuse me, uh, there are so many characters in the X Heroes books coming around that it just became an easier way for them to keep track of everything. So. Now you mentioned your time in Hollywood and uh, working as a as a props master on a number of different films. Yeah, how did you how did you get into that? Sheer luck. <laughs> it, it was honestly just a sheer luck thing. Uh, I grew up in New England, uh, got like got out of college, found out my college degree was pretty much worthless, um, ended up in a bad retail job and on a complete whim, moved to California with a friend of mine. Like, honestly, I was talking with her uh, in the food court of the mall we both worked in. And she was like, I'm moving to California in two weeks. You want to come? I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and I And I walked back to work, gave my boss my two weeks notice. Uh, called my parents who were living in Maine. I was in Massachusetts at the time. Said, I'm moving to California in two weeks. That's, <laughs> like, what are you going to do? I don't know. Um, but I got out here. I'm in California now. I got out here. Um, I had done some concert work back east at my college, and that helped me get some concert work here, which helped me get theater work here. And I was working at a little theater, uh, the San Diego Rep in downtown San Diego. And our production designer there, we were finishing up the season and he basically went to me and one other guy in the scene shop and said, so, Hey, I'm going to go work on a movie after this. You guys want to come and be swing gang and we're going to work on a movie. Hell yeah. (laughs) Uh, And that was kind of it. That just led me. That was an art department job that led to a prop job. And then I just sort of, I hit props and I had an affinity for it. 
that it was some, I liked the detail oriented, oriented nature of it. I liked keeping track of the continuity, all that sort of stuff. And then it was just getting job after job after job after job until I, I was tired of doing it. So, <laughs> so when, when a production, you know, you know, gets, gets the crew together, you know, goes to the process part and say, okay, we need this, 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 you know, what, what's the process for someone who's working, you know, as, as a process master, what's the process and how much of it is, is, you know, made in house and stuff, how much of it is, okay, we're going to go shopping. A lot of shopping. Cause, cause you figure, okay, for the most part, I never really did any, I did a couple things that were like period movies, TV shows, like things set in the fifties, whatever. Um, I never personally did anything that was like a huge sci-fi show, a big, you know, we're going to need to manufacture. Like, you know, if you did a Star Trek show, you can't just run out to Target and buy the salt shakers for Star Trek. You need, you know, these need to look like future Star Trek, you know, salt shakers or something. Um, so for the most part for us, it was buying, but it was also then became like, I, I very honestly did mostly low budget non-union stuff. Um, so a big chunk of this becomes sort of balancing your budget that they'll give you the script. You go through and do a breakdown of like every item that's going to be in every scene and then figuring out, okay, how can we get this? What do we need to rent? What do we need to buy? What do we need to make? What can we get by with, with like, uh, one of the film studios I did a lot of work at had their own prop house. So I can go pull some stuff from there, but that'll save me a little bit of money. Other times you'll have to go to a prop house, you know, up in LA and actually rent depending what, you know, weird things they need for it. You know, whether it be odd firearms or ray guns or swords, or, you know, sometimes just th there's a prop house called ISS and it's always fun because they actually, I haven't been there in years at this point, but they used to have, you could just go up and there was like the gadget shelf. And it was just all these weird little knickknack things people had made for one movie or another that you could then rent. Like, hey, do you need like some little weird gadget with a blinking light and a magnet so you can stick it to a wall? That'll be $5 a week. That'll be, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you need a three level crystal chessboard like they use on Star Trek? That's $6 a week, you know? So most of that is just, it's, it's budgeting It's sitting down. It, I would love to, t to say it's so exciting and so interesting, but for the most part, it's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> now of, of the films that you did work on, uh, were you able to kind of hold on to any of the props that, you know, you know, kind of became special? Not really. I mean, uh, most of the stuff becomes the, the property of the production. In some cases they would like, auction things off and I've had things, there would be things that I would, on one or two cases, I would buy something for the show, but I would buy it. It was not using the show's money to buy it specifically. So I could like use it myself and sometimes rent stuff back to like, the next show I was going to be on. Um, one of the only things, in fact, here's a great example. And this is a fun project for anyone listening. Uh, <laughs> I did a show called Animal Rescue Kids and massively under budgeted show. Like I, I had very seriously, like one twentieth the money I needed to do an episode every time. <laughs> so I quit after four episodes, <laughs> but one of the things that I bought for it at one point just to have was this little stuffed beaver. Like it's a, like a toy beaver. Um, as and, a Canadian, I approve. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, and well, because the show set at a vet, but we didn't actually have the money to put animals in cages. So you just needed to be able to see furry things in the cages sometimes behind the characters. So this thing had like a vaguely realistic looking fur. And every now and then I would just stick it behind it, you know, somebody's head in a, in a shot. Um, and I kept that. I'm, I, I bought it with my own money just for I would use it for a toy or something. But then it just became this crazy thing that like the next dozen movies I did, I stuck the beaver in somewhere. So it's like always in the, like not always in the background, but like if you know where to look, you can find it like hiding in that bush 
sitting on that mantle between people, you know, they're on this desk, they're on the table. So, well, I mean, if 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 Marvel movies and Disney movies can have like the A one 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 three number kind of throughout, yeah. exactly. Now, I do have to ask because as I was doing my research and I was going through the IMDb page, as I was you know doing some research about the uh, you know the prop being a prop master and whatnot, I came across something called Il Fatas. Oh yes. <laughs> so how how did that come about? <laughs> That was just, uh, it was a friend's project. It was a short film and it, it's a weird little movie about the tooth fairy. Um, and at one point he had a friend who was going to, uh, be one character in that and who is just called him. And that guy had to drop out and I had already been working with them on this. And so at one point, I had at that time like this weird nervous habit that if I held anything in my hand, like especially like some sort of an ID, a credit card, something like that, I would just start flipping it between my fingers. And he loved this and just like rewrote the whole thing. Again, it's a short film, but it was like, you're going to be him now. And so it's this whole weird thing, but I'm basically handing out assignments, which are tarot cards. I have no actual lines. It's just that like people will like walk up to my desk and I'll just be sitting here like, you know, flipping tarot cards between my fingers and then slap one down in front of them. And, and that's kind of it. That's all I do. It all. But... Now on Twitter, you, you kind of share your love of bad b-rated movies by watching and live tweeting with them um i i, I do have to ask because i I'll, I'll admit i love my b movies as well are we going to get the peter klein's watches bad b movies podcast eventually probably not i don't i don't think i could <laughs> i i could i honestly admire anyone who can do a podcast do that kind of thing because i i really don't think i'm that interesting and i would get very self-conscious like even just the just the live tweeting feels pretentious to me sometimes even even though i'm doing goofy funny stuff and making funny comments um so no i could never do a podcast uh there's another writer hugh howie a friend of mine and he has desperately tried to get me for ages he wants us to do like a saturday geekery watching bad b movies live at some convention that they'll just like give us a room for a day and we'll put the movies up and kind of do this like live mystery science theater thing but more dissecting it like trying to have fun with it pointing out like okay everyone knows this makes no sense right what's going on on screen right now makes no logical sense whatsoever <laughs> so it's basically the twitter version then of of riff tracks and mystery science theater 3000 a, a little bit but i i try to actually be useful about it like yes there are times where i'll just poke fun at things because like okay this is just so so stupid um, but there's also times when I try and point out like, okay, look, if we're going to do this in a movie, in a story, you need to be doing this. You know, these two things are sort of corollaries. I can't have the mystery without having an, the resolution. I can't, you know, if I'm going to have this, there needs to be a reason for it. And that's the kind of stuff I try to point out. And, you know, a lot of that spills into like you were talking about before the ranty writing blog of you know, just sort of trying to point out to people, because because I think, again, this this is going to be me speaking in broad, sweeping generalities. I think a lot of creative folks, myself and definitely included, when we start out, we try to copy stuff. You know, um, I tried to copy stories I was reading in you know old paperbacks and comic books and stuff. I'm sure a lot of musicians start off trying to copy. How did he do that awesome guitar riff? How did he do that drum solo? That sort of thing. Um, but I think one problem a lot of us have, and again, us, is that we will learn part of something and not understand that this is very good and very cool and very exciting and very interesting within this framework. You know, there's lots of songs that have amazing drum solos. Um, that doesn't mean you can pull that drum solo out and drop it into any other song and it will still be amazing, you know? Um, and the same thing with 
that cool scene in a movie, that neat chapter in a book. Yes, it was really cool when this happened in the Avengers. It was really neat when this happened in the stand. But that doesn't mean I can just sort of do a half-assed copy of that scene at any random point in my story, and it's going to have the same weight, the same impact, and and fit just as well. You, so. you, can, you can see that too in a little bit of directing. Like I, uh, you know, I, I always flash back to that first Hulk movie, the uh, the Ang Lee directed one with Eric mm-hmm. Bana in it, and you know he's got these you know great close ups where you know you're supposed to be at the, you know when the camera's that close, you know, you know almost kind of reading into the mindset and Eric Bannon's just sitting there like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not mad. You know, it's, it's just, you know, the framing doesn't work in that context. Um, but you mentioned conventions and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people over this past, you know, basically year and a half that mm-hmm. have missed going to those conventions, whether it's San Diego Comic-Con or here, uh, here at uh, Toronto Comic-Con up here, or, or basically around the world. Um, how much do you miss conventions? I miss them a lot. I, it's very funny. Uh, I, I, I'm living in San Diego now. I actually lived, I lived in San Diego when I first moved to California. I moved to LA for about 12, 13 years, and now I'm back in San Diego. Um, so, I actually got to go to San Diego Comic-Con when it literally was just like walk up to the door and buy your pass and go in. (laughs) Um, But I've seen it grow over the years. And so I got to enjoy a lot of these cons as a fan for many, many years. Um, And now just over the past 10 years for me, I'm in this weird position of going to cons as a guest, as like one of the people, other people are actually coming to see, which is, bizarre to me that anyone would spend money to come see me blather on like this. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I really do enjoy it. Although uh, another author, I kind of know Richard Cadry, I was talking with him and a third author friend, Stephen Blackmore, about how it can also get kind of draining though, that it, it was funny when he said it at the time, I was like, what? Never. And then like within a year, I think it's like, oh my God, he's so right <laughs> that, you know, doing, I still love doing them, but it, it does become a little more tiring, a little less fun when you're doing it as work. Um, I still try to go every time, like if I, if I get to go to San Diego, if I go to New York Comic Con, anything, I love spending a day and walking around the floor. You know, seeing the booth, seeing exhibits, seeing all that stuff. I love, I still love that. And I love, you know, getting to talk to people about stuff on the floor, all that. I've also found, you know, I'm I'm getting a little older, like I can do that once. You know, I I don't want to spend days at San Diego Comic Con (laughs) on the floor or anything. Um, So I still love going. I love being on panels, meeting people. And I'm really hoping maybe by the end of this year, we'll start seeing some of that come back. Hopefully next summer. Um, everybody get your shots. I was, but, to, <laughs> I was about to say, cause anyone who's actually been to uh, a comic con or a convention like that, you know, especially when you're walking, you know, amongst the, 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 the merch booths and whatnot, it's your shoulder to shoulder. It's oh, yeah. jam packed in there. Uh, and you know, it, it's almost right now it's anxiety inducing to think about that many people oh, in, in an enclosed, yes. you know, indoor space. And you have to think like that those first cons back, you know, what is it going to look like? And do you, as someone who, you know, either, either as an attendee or as someone, you know, either, you know, hosting a panel or doing an autograph session, do you have anxiety about what those first cons are going to look like? I don't know. Cause I mean, it, so much of it comes down to, you know, when, like right now, yes, I'm looking forward to it. If someone called me up and shot me an email and said, Hey, we're doing a con in January. Do you want to come? I would probably say yes. At the same time, I would still be watching, you know, case numbers and everything as we got closer and closer. And, uh, what's going to happen? I mean, okay. I figure right at the beginning of this, um, I was supposed to be a guest at WonderCon uh, in Anaheim. And if I'm remembering right, WonderCon was actually one of the very first conventions to cancel because of COVID. Um, but it was this thing like we had actually friend, a friend who was going to fly down from Vancouver and stay with us. And 
Nakanwas, and we were all just kind of like watching case numbers, watching things happen, and just wondering like, are we still doing this? Are we still going? Is there going to happen? And and I think it's probably going to be like that for a little bit. That until not to hammer at home, everyone gets their shots. If, you know, we can we can actually beat this thing to some extent, or at least beat it up and shove it in a closet for a while. Um, I think everything's going to have that anxiety. You know, anything you need to do is going to be just a little grating. You know, on on the nerves to go out and do something and think, oh my God, I'm going to have like 200 people walk past. Like, there's no way I'm not going to be in contact with 200 people today. So yeah, you can't really hand sanitize after every handshake. Yeah. I mean, leaving huge wet stains on every book I sign or something, <laughs> but all right, talk all it'll dry out. <laughs> um, he put, he put the hand sanitizer handprint on it. It's, it's actually him. <laughs> All books returned vacuum sealed and sterilized in a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it would just, I think it's going to be nerve wracking for everybody that, you know, you don't want to think of like, okay, being on a panel and you're in a small room with 200 people who are all in this room breathing together and even, you know, clogging up the air, depending on, you know, how good the circulation is. You're in an autograph line, you know, and from either side of it, I mean, you're, you're the person giving the autographs. And you're going to have 200 people of questionable provenance coming by, you know, wondering, you know, who's actually been vaccinated, who's just a jerk, who's like, ah, I mean, it's all 5G conspiracy, you know. Oh, I- um, <laughs> yeah. And even if you're standing in a line, you're wondering that about everybody around you. You're wondering, you're wondering that about the guy signing the books, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, I, 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 it's funny. Like I, I take a look at sporting events, and you know, and it's it's very weird, you know, because you know, up here in Canada, of course, you know, we're right we're right now in the middle of the the, the NHL playoffs, mm-hmm. and you know, you watch a game happening in Vegas, and the arena's full, you know, and you watch a game happening about Montreal, and maybe you got five hundred people, but you know, they're like vaccinated frontline workers, and the dichotomy is so different. It's just, it's it's very odd. Um, getting back to your to your books. We're in a uh, an age of unprecedented content creation with Netflix and with Apple and with Amazon, all finding properties, whether they be comic book properties or literature properties, especially in science fiction. You know, you had Netflix picking up the, the Altered Carbon series mm-hmm. and, and Jupiter's Legacy. You've got Amazon doing the Invincible comic book series. So how much hope do you have of someone, you know, yeah. Hey, Nathan Fillion, uh, someone want to mention the, uh, the X hero series or one of your other works and adapting that for the screen. I, I always have hope, but again, since I've worked in Hollywood, it's very realistic hope. Um, I know I have a good fan base. I have a lot of really wonderful fans. I know they generate interest, but I also am very aware of the fact that my books hover like right on that, that threshold line of if it was above this line, no question, Hollywood grab it. And there would at least be like a pilot or a low budget movie or something of this out there. And if it was below the line, no problem to ignore it, but it's on the line. And so I actually get lots of interest. Um, I, I do not think there has been a point in the past 10 years when something of mine hasn't been optioned that there isn't somebody who has given me money so they can play with the idea of making a movie or a series or something uh, out of one of my books. That said, it's been 10 years and, you know, nobody's seen anything. <laughs> so um, I'm just realistic about it that way. There's, there's stuff going on right now and I have high hopes for it. They're realistic hopes, but you know, <laughs> the, the, the fingers are crossed. That's kind of it. It's all you can do. And I think it's a, it's the only way you can stay sane with it. It's just kind of nod and admit, look, it's going to happen or it's not, it's not going to have anything to do with me one way or another. You know, if it does happen, if it did, you know, we would have seen, I don't know, somebody would have done like my Robinson Crusoe werewolf book by now. And 
for sci-fi. Okay. <laughs> now, the other side of that is that, you know, you've had the chance to write in other intellectual properties. There's a short story of yours in an X-Files compilation. Mm-hmm. And being the the lover of, of all things geekery that you are, if you had a chance to, is there a property that you would actually really love to write for? I, I have said this so many times. I would love to do a ROM Space Night uh, comic or novel or whatever they'd let me do. Um, it's a character. I loved it when he first appeared doing Marvel stuff. I love it when they went over in IDW, recently did some stuff with that I love. I actually know the editor who would be the guy to talk to, and I, I mildly bug him every couple months with so so <laughs> when do i get to write wrong when 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 um that's probably the big one i mean obviously there's there's marvel characters dc characters i would i'd love to do a machine man story or a blue devil story um but a lot of it just comes down to like for me i have a lot of friends who write for star wars for example and i don't know if i'd want to write for star wars like it would be so tempting that they'd it would come but in on one level i'm such a fan of it i don't know if i could separate myself enough from that and the, and as i was say and the funny thing is rom is such you know an, an out there pick but seeing that idw kind of picked it up and put it in with that that big idw you know that that universe you know with transformers yeah, with so, gi joe which was like, so much fun it was <laughs> And I mean, like, I remember reading Rom Space Night. I had Rom Space Night comics. Like, it's, it's, you, you are literally the only other person I know. Like, if I said Rom Space Night, it'd be like, I understand you. I get it. Um, there's a lot of people out there, but it's, it's just because I think it's, it's such a weird copyright thing. Since so much of, like, Rom, the actual intellectual property is such a narrow thing. And what most people think of when they think of, oh, Rom, is the entire universe Marvel built around it. Or, you know, maybe more people, the entire universe IDW built around it. But the actual character is such a, a narrow wedge with so very little to him. You know, I mean, basically, he's a cyborg future knight or alien knight fighting shape-changing aliens, and that's it. That's the entire pitch for Rom <laughs> of like, I mean, there's what the inner box art and one commercial that they had at a, at a trade show. And that's, it. that's the entire IP. <laughs> so it's when you realize that Battletech had more cartoons than Rom ever did. Seriously. You know, you, you look at all this stuff that you think is underdeveloped. You go, Oh no, you want to hear what underdeveloped is. Um, and I, and I love it. And I know uh, David, the editor has told me, yeah, you know, one of the things is it has to be this. It has to be completely separate. And I'm like, no, I know, I know. I, I've got my own ideas of what I want to do and how I see it. But um, would it ever happen? Who knows? I mean, I'm currently, I think my agent is shopping a book right now that I wrote during the pandemic. And he's currently looking at a six book pitch. So depending if they offered it to me, I could maybe get to ROM sometime in 2022 or 23. So, <laughs> well, if, if that happens, I am running to the bookstore and picking that Thank up. You. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk about the Peter Klein's writing process. So when you sit okay. down to actually write a book, um, what's your writing environment? Do you have music playing? Do you prefer super quiet? Like, And as you're writing these characters, do you kind of hear... Yeah, you know, uh, you know, an orchestral score is if there was going to be a film to it. Okay, multiple things. Uh, I'm in my office right now, so I do have my own little writing environment. I am a big fan of music when I write. Um, my partner is not when she writes. So generally, I'm listening on headset, um, you know, as loud as I can. Um, <laughs> The other weird thing, though, is that I will pick when I'm writing songs for a project. Um, but then what ends up happening is I go through this sort of weird weeding out process of, you know, uh, delete a song, delete a song. I'll have like a playlist for this book that I just start weeding down. But part of the weeding down process is literally all the songs that stand out. And I 
kind of at the end of it have just let it become this sort of white noise that I don't really register half of it. Um, and it will keep, like you were saying, a mood or a tone that I like, but past that, like it's not so much a soundtrack as almost like a subliminal keeping me in the mood sort of thing. That sounded dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It was going right about superheroes and zombies. Let's get, we can let's, delete that, right? Let's, let's, let's get our groove on. <laughs> <laughs> but with, uh, uh, jumping back to the X Hero series, you know, you have these, you know, the, you know, to me, you know, I, I, I can t- completely hear a full score. But if you were to put a theme song to the characters, like what, you know, can you, can you imagine kind of who would have what kind of theme song? I, I, it's actually funny because I know when you first approached me and asked me about that, you mentioned this, and I started thinking about it and. This is the truth, and it's actually very funny that this happened. Honest truth, when I was writing the first Six Heroes book, and then it became like a regular thing, the the theme song for St. George, who's sort of the quasi-main character of the series, or the central protagonist, really, out of the group. Um, And I don't even remember how it sort of ended up being this, but it was Bonnie Raitt's uh, I Need a Hero, Mm. um, from originally from Footloose. And when you mentioned this, I thought, oh, it would be funny. I'll bring this up because I've always liked this. And I think it is a very St. George song. It's very positive, heroic, high energy. Also has this kind of weird 80s vibe that I think fits him a little better than, I I think St. George is much more of like an old classic comic hero than a modern hero, like modern comic book hero. But that's just my take. Well, Um, it's funny you mentioned that song. It's that that's the song they used for on the, the He-Man the, trail, exactly. <laughs> just came out. and that was it. So, so that happened, and then yesterday that came out. I'm like, well, can't talk about this. <laughs> God damn it, He-Man! Stop <laughs> taking all his ideas. <laughs> Kevin Smith, what are you doing? <laughs> Scooping me again. <laughs> um. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> um. Past that, I I I actually made up a little list of like different characters, what they'd probably listen to as I started thinking about it. Um, I know it's really funny, but I think uh, Stealth, this is going to sound weird. I think Stealth would listen to a lot of classical music, but not in the, oh, look, she's supposed to be super smart. She listens to classical music way. Um, But I think there's a couple composers who, I don't think, I mean, there were a couple composers, um, who did a lot of neat stuff with music in the sense that uh, like Mozart loved putting numbers into his work and doing mathematical things and numerical codes in his work. Um, Bach did a lot of stuff with almost like cryptography in his work. I mean, uh, uh, I just freaking blanked on it. Uh, I think it's the Bach sequence where in, in German, they actually have an H note. So, so you could spell Bach musically. So he has actually inserted his name into most of his music. Yeah, I think I've only hit an H note by hitting the wrong note in a song. <laughs> it's just, it's, I think, crap, I can't remember what it actually is, like in, in what we would use for musical notation. It's just one of those things like where we have like an A sharp or something like that. They just call that H. Mm-hmm. Um. But because of that, Bach had B-A-C-H that he could work with. And so you can find those four notes in that order all through his work. And that's the kind of thing that I think Stealth would probably do, that she would listen to. She would listen to classical music like that, the way some people do like their Sudoku puzzle that really it's just something in the background letting her mind like, ah, there are those four notes. There's that. It's, it's a decryption exercise for her more than like music, if that makes sense. So that would be her soundtrack. Um, Danielle, who built the Cerberus armor. Um, I This is another thing that I actually was listening to. Uh, there's an audio slave song and I just blanked on the name of it. But it was in all the Iron Man trailers mm. for, the, for the very first Iron Man movie. 
uh, they had the opening to it because it has this great, very mechanical gear sound that the song opens with. And I don't know, I just always sort of identified that because it was always the shots of Tony Stark in the cave hammering that first Iron Man suit together. And I always thought that would fit her very well since the the server suit in the comics, in the comics, in my books, is not some sleek Iron Man suit. It is a much more practical, it has big pistons and hydraulics and all that sort of stuff suit. So the the idea of someone having to solve problems with with a hammer, I think fits a lot better for her. And I guess Barry would be the one other big character. Uh, Barry would definitely just be listening to movie soundtracks. Probably a lot of 80s stuff. Probably like Transformers the movie. I, I was about Star- to say the, the Vince <laughs> DiCola soundtrack special. Oh, yes, exactly. That's, you know, uh, Battle Beyond the Stars, like a lot of those, like Roger Corman, that sort of stuff. That is... That would 100% be very central. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now that we've touched on music, uh, and I, I know this is the part you, you kind of dreading because you were talking, you were telling me about uh, your own personal taste, but it now comes oh, to crap. the points. Oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, oh, I didn't do my oh. homework. This is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> so, oh. well, we're still going to give it a try anyways. Don't don't worry. We won't grade you on your homework, but we're still going to give it a try <laughs> anyways. So, Peter Kleins, if you had to introduce yourself to a complete and utter stranger by handing them a mixtape, and on that tape are songs that told the story of you. What's on that tape and why are those songs there? Oh, dear God. Um, pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- this is honestly just such a weird question for me, really. Like, I, I we joked about when, we, when you first contacted me. Most of the people I know would say I have horrible musical taste. Um, there's so many odd, weird things I listen to. Um, I mean, this is so bizarre. When I first moved to California, the album I was listening to constantly while I wrote was the Nuns on the Run soundtrack. I don't is, think I've, I don't think I've actually seen that movie. <laughs> it's it's actually a, a, for what it is, it's a pretty funny movie. And it's Eric Idle and Robbie Coltrane. Um, oh wait, no, I have seen that one actually. Yes, uh, <laughs> but most of the music is by uh, Yellow the okay. 80s band um and there's like some other random stuff mixed in there but i don't know why that just sort of became like the the music of my move to california album uh so yeah i'd probably throw something from that on there to start with uh crap i'm not sure i think there's a, the first song on the album is the race is the name of it and that's more or less the the i think that's kind of the theme to the movie uh, so we'll go with that. So starting off great, nuns on the run. Uh, <laughs> after that, um, songs from childhood, uh, probably some John Williams. I was also a big music score kid. So I'd probably say, let's go with the Star Wars theme and the Raiders March from Raiders of Lost Ark. Those mm. were two things I listened to many, 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 many times as a kid. Um, uh, hmm. Noah's favorite song for a long time has actually been Journey. Uh, Well, the the song uh, Midnight Train by Journey. Okay. Um, That is, I don't know why, but that song has just always stuck with me for years and years and years. Oh, uh, uh, Don't Stop Believing. Yes, thank you. Uh, (laughs) That song that stuck with me that I can't remember the name of. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many songs out there. You know that song by that band? That song by the band. You know yeah. the one that goes da da da. <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, Has four chords, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, college was probably the one time that I uh, like had good musical taste briefly for a small window. Um, that's when I discovered Sisters of Mercy, mm. which was just this like this, I don't know, like, ah, moment for me. The the guy across the who lived across the hall from me, Mike, was the music guy, like on my college dorm. That he just had all this music that you know no one had ever heard of and everything. And he played uh, Floodlands one day, just put on the album, let the whole thing play, and I was just awestruck. It's one of the only times I can remember, like, hearing a song just 
instantly wanting to know, like, oh my God, what is this? What is this band? What is this? This is amazing. You know? <laughs> um, so I'll throw some Sisters of Mercy in there. Um, wow, I'm, I'm so not the person for this. <laughs> um, I don't know, right? I've got Sophie Tucker stuck in my head, but I think part of that might just be because I, uh, like I talk about how I have, like I, I sort of prune a, a writing list down to like the white noise stage of it. And somehow the, uh, the book I just finished was mostly written to Sophie Tucker and the who. So I know I had like uh, Baba O'Reilly probably played like 200 times on my computer during the writing of that book. Uh, Swing by Sophie Tucker probably played 200 something times. Um, so I'll, I'll say Sophie Tucker go on there and the who. Uh, man, I'm so bad at this. Maybe something by Sting. Um, I was really into Sting in high school, David Bowie. Um, God, I'm sorry. I can't think of anything else. Uh, I, th I think I've embarrassed myself enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what, though? The, the funny thing is, you know, I'm sitting there listening. It was like, because you, you had said that, you know, you had, you know, as, as you had put it, you know, the worst tasting music. And I'm sitting there listening. I'm like, no, no, this, this all sounds, this, you know, I, I was expecting, you know, you know, something completely like everything on Glockenspiel, but no, it's, uh, <laughs> I think you're all good. Okay. There. So the funny thing is, do you remember when iTunes first became a thing mm -hmm. as in the program you could have on your computer, one of the early features they had was if your computer was on Wi-Fi, it would find other people's iTunes nearby. And it was I, one of those, I didn't even yeah, know that. <laughs> yeah. It was one of these weird things they did where like, you, you could shut it off if you wanted, but it be, of course, Apple, this was the default. It starts on when you download like iTunes 3 or something like that. Um, back before we had worries about privacy or anything like that. Uh, so what happened was my then girlfriend 17 years ago, now a life partner, um, maybe the second or third time I ever went over to her place, ostensibly to work on writing stuff, um, I brought my computer and opened it up and she glanced over my shoulder at iTunes in the playlist and just said, Oh, don't worry about it. That's my up upstairs neighbor who went by the name, like Kurt dog or something like that. It would come up like <laughs> Kurt dog's iTunes. I was like, Oh, that's just my upstairs neighbor. He has such horrible stuff on his iTunes all the time. And I was like, that's, that's my iTunes. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when, when all fails, blame it on the upstairs neighbor. Exactly. Yeah. So, so anyway, if you lived in Koreatown 15 years ago, Kurt Dog, whoever you are, my girlfriend and I still love you and still laugh. At you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for this. Where can we find you on social media, and what is next for Peter Kleins? Um, social media, I'm very easy. I have somehow managed to be me everywhere. I'm at Peter Kleins on Twitter, at Peter Kleins on Instagram, um, peterkleins.com. Uh, next up for me, hopefully, I have a book out right now that is being shopped around by my agent, uh, which he is basically pitching. He read it, loved it. Um, he's pitching it as Jack Reacher meets Stranger Things. So that's his, hopefully, we'll see that for me maybe next year, early next year. And Right now, I'm kind of diving into, like I mentioned, uh, this big six book series, which I'm I'm excited and terrified for because I've never done something before where I have planned a series beginning to end as one big story, or really like six individual stories that turn out to be one big story. Um, so that's my big scary thing, and I guess we'll I'll hopefully be able to talk more about that in the near future.
Well, fingers crossed. And if you have not had a chance to read any of Peter's work, uh, aside from the X Hero series, there's 14, The Fold, Paradox Bound. There is a ton of stuff out there. It is all really good. I, I speak from experience. You will not regret picking up a book or pop it on the headphones if you get uh, Terminus off, off of Audible and dive it into the world. Peter, thank you so much for this. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to the Major Mixtape Podcast. If you're listening to us on any of the audio streaming services, you can watch this entire interview over on YouTube. But if you're watching this interview on YouTube and have watched me shamelessly laugh and, and smile through this whole thing, you can uh, go to one of the audio streaming services and download and listen to it on the go. This has been... The Major Mixtape Podcast. I'm your host, Jason. We'll see you next time.